Hello and welcome to tonight's book reading session of Preparing for the Day After, a picture ebook. Preparing for the Day After is a photojournalistic treatise on disaster mitigation published by me, Malini Shankar and Walter Keller for the 10th anniversary of the Asian tsunami. Tonight we will learn about the impact of the, of the Asian tsunami on the economy and tourism in the near term and long term and infrastructure. This is chapter 17 part 2. But let us first recap what we have learned in the previous book reading session before we start tonight's session. Water and sanitation is central to developmental discourse. Culture sensitive food security also has evolved out of local agrometeorological conditions prevalent in an area. Livelihoods based on local agrometeorological conditions are the best means of ensuring livelihood security. Climate change adaptation, menstrual hygiene, especially for indigenous tribal women, solid waste management, universal health care access, sustainable development goals, they are all factors to be included in the development agenda. <clears throat> Media personnel have to be trained in reporting disaster preparedness or the lack of it at district level. Disaster is the impact of a calamity on the human landscape. This includes the impact on lives, livelihoods, livestock and landscape. Tonight we will continue with the second part of chapter 17 that is the impact of the Asian tsunami on tourism in the near and long term, infrastructure and economy. Continuing from where I left off on microfinance in Indonesia, I will start again today. Quote, there are indications that not all of the rehabilitation programs above were as efficient or effective in practice as they had been expected to be by donors and program executors. Several types of aid did not have a significant effect or benefit for the fishermen and fish farmers in recovering their livelihoods and incomes. This was due to the fact facts that one, several of the aid boats were made from fiber, which is not appropriate for local sea conditions. Aid boats and fishing equipment did not meet standard specifications for local fishermen, primarily in the very low quality of wood used for the boats, which quickly, quickly broke or began leaking. Often material aid and equipment which have complementary benefits like boats and fishing equipment were not given together in one package, but separately by different programs and donors at different times. Often the number of aid packages distributed was smaller than the number of people requiring the aid and to prevent conflicts within the community, the packages were divided again into equal parts and given to all the beneficiaries in smaller amounts. As a result, the benefits to be reaped from the aid decreased. Moreover, in several cases, the aid items were not used for productive efforts, but rather misused for daily consumptive needs, unquote, says the International Recovery Program report. Evidence shows that the tsunami destroyed all ponds in Desa Lamga. However, the majority of these ponds have already been rebuilt or repaired by various parties. The rep reparation efforts focused on physical reconstruction rather than fixing coastal ecosystem conditions. Consequently, some of the ponds that were repaired have not yet become as productive as they were before the tsunami. Apparently, ecosystem restoration is no less important than physical restoration. This conclusion is consistent with Fauzi's Back to the Future concept of 2004 that there are three main restoration items needed that is back to create healthy fisheries for the future that is to the future ecosystem restoration should not only repair physical ponds but also coastal ecosystems including an updated database pred predicting the stock sdi boats etc local and vertical or top-down restoration institutions repair communications between stakeholders restore property rights and protect protect food security Economic restoration refers to economic justice or economic ethics in the perception of fishing resources, not only as mere and merely an engine of growth, but also from non-market aspects. A method must be implemented so that fish farmers are encouraged to do vegetative in addition to physical reconstruction of destroyed ponds. Silvo fishery, as it's called, and facilitating the application of silvo fishery models including planting trees in and around ponds by offering incentives such as business capital. Cross-sector issues, poverty, 
Programs to rebuild houses with community involvement can directly help reduce poverty. Those who earn their living as construction workers can put their skills to use building houses in their community and the money they earn can feed their families or can be added to funds to build their own homes. Rebuilding a village is not just about rebuilding homes, but also about rebuilding infrastructure and government regu regulated facilities. Involving the community means that the community serves as a connection between the government and individual citizens. Indirectly, payments community members receive can feed their families. Houses built by community themselves take into account the health of the residents. Although the houses are small, the community members still made houses that are healthy for their families. Living environment. The issues of the living environment were taken into account by the community and village administration. Community members had to think about how the environment contributes to their lives and their involvement in every building decision ensures that they can help protect the environment in which they live. Gender. The results of our correspondence and interviews indicated that there were no obstacles to women's participation in home reconstruction. Women were, not, were involved not only in rebuilding their own homes, but also in joining community teams that help to solve problems between the community and the donors. In Sri Lanka, in Sri Lanka, seductive white sand beaches of Arugum Bay, Hamban Tota, Tangala, Mathara and Gala were pounded and pulverized, leaving debris and decimation where the moon once shone on couples in love and the sea breeze wafted through palm leaves on the beaches. In 2004, Sri Lanka had a gross domestic product of US dollars 1031 per capita and its economy was shifting from a reliance on the agricultural sector to greater reliance on the service and industrial sectors. In 2004, services and industry contributed to 56% and 26% of Sri Lanka's GDP respectively compared with an 18% contribution from agriculture including fishing. Fishing, hotels and tourism together contributed 3% of the gross national product including 100,000 jobs in the fishing industry and 27,000 jobs in tourism. Employment numbers in the industrial sector grew by mere by more than 600,000 to 1.7 million, while employment numbers in the services sector nearly doubled from 1.7 million in 1990 to 3.2 million in 2004. In 2004, the total number of people employed in all sectors was 7.4 million. About two thirds of Sri Lanka's 29,700 fishing boats were damaged along with gear and nets. Unemployment rates were in a steady decline from a high of 15.9% in 1990 to a low of 7.6% in 2000, but rose to 8.3% in 2004. During the same period, unemployment rates generally were twice as high among women as for men. In 2004, 6% of the male labor force was unemployed, whereas 12.8% of the female labor force was unemployed. The provinces impacted by the tsunami did not provide a large portion of the GNP. The South and Northeast provinces made up 26% of the total population of Sri Lanka, but they contributed only 17.5% of the GNP. One quarter of one third of the population in these provinces were below the poverty line, which contributed to increased vulnerability to the forces brought by the tsunami. Approximately 5,000 small businesses and 200,000 jobs are estimated to have been lost due to the tsunami. A survey of livelihoods consisting of interviews of 1,627 people in tsunami impacted areas in January and February 2005 found that 30% of Sri Lankan households in impacted areas had been poor before the tsunami, the WHO report estimates. The districts of Hambantota and Batikaloa had the highest incidence of tsunami impacted households that had been poor before the tsunami. Preliminary estimates by the WHO indicated that damages inflicted totaled about 1.5 billion US dollars or 7% of the GNP. Two thirds of the fishing industry was destroyed or damaged and 5,000 village industries were decimated. Damage to agriculture and livestock cost some 3 million US dollars. Fishing and related small scale food processing were affected by the most by the disaster. Of the country's 29,700 fishing boats, about 2,000 Two thirds were destroyed or significantly damaged, along with outboard motors, ice storage units, fishing gear, and net. Entire fishing communities were dependent on these fleets. Damage to the agriculture sector included the destruction of standing crops and home gardens, washing away of tree top, 
tree crop and entry of sea water to productive fields which may render them un unusable for many months. An estimated 27,000 jobs in the tourism industry were suspended by the tsunami, one third in officially registered hotels and the rest in unregistered hotels and guest houses. Many small businesses and informal traders catering to the tourism industry, example dive souvenir businesses and informal traders catering to the example dive souvenir handicraft shops and internet cafes were damaged and are now facing a sustained period with a far fewer customers the main tourism season of january to march 2005 is likely to be lost entirely the largest sum of money for relief and recovery from a disaster caused by a natural hazard was pledged during the earthquake tsunami disaster to Sri Lanka by the end of 2005. It, it, it totaled 13.6 billion US dollars with donations from 92 countries. However, more than, more than for any of the other country in this study, the distribution of the funds allocated to Sri Lanka for relief and recovery have been most difficult to identify and track. The ethnic strife in Sri Lanka's north and east took a toll on humanitarian aid efforts. The government of Sri Lanka could not reach conflict-ridden areas of the north and east because those areas were under LTTE control, embittered aid workers and agencies. Inadequate infrastructure, one of the root causes of the ethnic conflicts, challenged humanitarian aid and disaster response. So, UN agencies could not eventually get accurate feedback of effective aid distribution. Since the tsunami, despite the tsunami and the civil war, the Sri Lankan economy has grown by an average of 8% per year driven primarily by strong agriculture and services industries, expanding industrial production and a huge growth in tourism. Peace and expectation have attracted investments and return of the land from the LTTE has boosted cultivation in the Northeast province. Sri Lanka has invested in development of a major port in Hambantota, which will produce thousands of new jobs and should attract foreign investment. In 2010, its GDP had increased to US dollars 42 billion with a per capita income of uh, 20% of its GDP in 2004. In Sri Lanka, several thousands of fruit and rice farms in areas such as Trincomalee and Batikaloa districts have been affected by salt contamination. Most people in rural Sri Lanka rely on wells for their drinking water, yet all dug wells in areas where the tsunami intruded, an estimated 662,000 of them are now contaminated by seawater and often by wastewater and sewage water as well. This is an especially serious problem in Trincomalee, Ampara, Ampara Batikaloa and Hambantota district. The pipe bone water supply system in the coastal areas is also largely out of service. These factors together undermine public access both to drinking water and to water for irrigation. Wells can be pumped out and chlorinated. But in some areas, aquifers have also been contaminated, which must be diluted and leached back to purity over months or perhaps years of rainfall. Initial surveys showed that rice fields in the eastern districts of Trincomalee and Batikaloa have been heavily damaged. These rice fields produce more than one third of the country's total harvest. The extent of crop damage may have been underestimated in reports to date since salt has affected several thousand rice and fruit farms and has dried to form a crust on the soil in many areas, leading to concerns that fields will be unusable for many months until rains naturally reduce salinity. Fortunately, the seasonal rains have been heavy since the tsunami. Increased poverty is potentially the most important effect of this natural calamity. The macroeconomic impact of the tsunami is expected to be worse in Sri Lanka than in other affected countries apart from the Maldives, but the macro level of analysis conceals a much more sinister impact on the livelihoods of the poor. Fisheries, tourism, trade, agriculture and artisanal or cottage industries provided most of the livelihoods in the affected areas and all have been severely impacted. The worst effects, worst effects of the tsunami were experienced by people living in weakly constructed and unplanned settlements close to the shore, women and children deprived of breadwinners and those with marginal livelihoods as cottage artisans. A large number of home-based production and income generating activities were destroyed, affecting women in particular and reducing family incomes. The catastrophe could drive around 250,000 more people below the poverty line and these numbers could increase if concerns over basic needs are not properly and quickly addressed. Damage to the agriculture sector included the destruction of standing crops and home gardens, washing away of tree crops and entry of seawater to productive fields which may render them unusable for many months. In Thailand, 
Thailand's Ao Nang, Patong Beach, Phuket, Phang Na, Khao Lak, Khao Lanta, and Kopi Pi wither in the aftermath of the tsunami. There were reports that around 3,000 Swedish tourists succumbed to the tsunami in Thailand itself. Total damages were assessed at around 508 million US dollars, while losses were estimated at 1690 US million US dollars. Total damages were assessed at around 508 million US dollars, while losses were estimated at 1690 million dollars, totaling 2198 million US dollars or 1.4% of GDP. The impact on the affected provinces were quite severe. It was assessed to be equivalent to one half of the combined gross provincial product or GPP. In some areas, such as the such as in the case of Phuket, damage and losses equaled 90% of GPP, and in Krabi and Fangna, they were around 70%. Though the impact of the tsunami was quite severe, after accepting technical assistance at the early stages, Thailand relied mostly on its own resources in coping with the reconstruction tasks, unlike Indonesia and Sri Lanka. Thailand's experience with the wider economic effects of large-scale reconstruction activities also seems to have differed from that of other affected countries in some respects. Overall, Thailand appears to have been more successful than Indonesia and Sri Lanka in overcoming the economic effects of the tsunami. This provides an interesting contrast to the experience of Sri Lanka and Indonesia, which relied heavily on international assistance in their reconstruction efforts, says Bhanu Poong Nidhi Prabha in the ADBI-sponsored study called Adjustment and Recovery in Thailand two years after the tsunami. In the cases of Indonesia and Sri Lanka, the largest economic losses from the tsunami came from damages to physical infrastructure and property. In contrast, Thailand's biggest source of losses were estimated to have come from productive sectors, particularly tourism, because the most severely affected areas were key tourism destinations. As a result, initial estimates of analysts led to forecasts of significant reductions in the GDP growth rate. JP Morgan, for example, revised the first quarter growth rate of 2005 to zero from the previous projection of 3%. In 2000, the 2005 annual GDP growth rate was also revised downward by 0.3% to 5.7%. Similarly, Morgan Stanley reduced its annual growth projection from 6% to 5.7%, citing in particular the dampening multiplier effects on the economy of the damage caused by the tsunami on the tourism industry, says Bhanu Poong Nidhi Prabha. The need for eco-friendly infrastructure was thus underlined in Thailand. Thailand's higher resilience from stronger economic infrastructure and multiple economic revenue sectors manifested in a strange way. The impact of the tsunami was spread over a large number of villages in these provinces, which made provision of immediate relief difficult. Krabi had the highest number of affected villages, but not the largest number of casualties. In total, the tsunami directly affected 12,815 households, comprising more than 58,550 people. A total of 3,302 houses were destroyed and 1,504 were damaged. Fang Na accounted for 52% of the total house destruction, followed by Phuket with 21% and Krabi with 14%. According to Thailand's DDPM or the Department of Disaster Prevention and Mitigation, total economic loss due to damage to livelihoods was 373,354,000 US dollars in the six most affected provinces on the Andaman coast, Phangna, Phuket, Krabi, Ranong, Satul and Trang provinces. The secondary impact of the tsunami hit when victims lost their livelihoods. This occurred either because capital equipment used in their jobs was destroyed as in fisheries, or because they lost jobs in the tourist sector due to hotels being damaged or cutting employment following falls in tourist numbers, even though some workers were willing to accept pay cuts to keep their jobs, says Bhanu Puong Nidhi Prabha in his work, the ADBI-sponsored study called Adjustment in Recovery in Thailand two years after the tsunami. Most of the losses inflicted on people's livelihoods, or about 88%, 80, came from the damage to business properties in Phang Na, Phuket, and Krabi. Most of these properties were hotels which were critical to the tourism industry. Fisheries was the second most affected sector, or 12%, while damage to livestock and agriculture was negligible.
In Fangna, though most of the bad damage was to business properties, the fisheries sector was also, also significantly affected. Many fishing boats were lost or damaged and there were extensive damages to fish cages and shrimp hatcheries, which in turn affected the wider shrimp, southern shrimp industry, which relied on supplies of post larvae from these hatcheries. This investor assessment of the long-term impact of the tsunami on the economy was, however, more optimistic compared with the early assessments of the most official and private sector analysts. As already mentioned, JP Morgan predicted a zero growth rate for the first quarter of 2005, while both JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley revised downward their annual growth forecast by 3%, sorry, by 0.3%. The Bank of Thailand also projected a reduction of annual GDP growth by 0.3% due to the tsunami, even after taking into account the growth momentum of the last quarter in 2004 and expected compensating effects of soft loans and other assistance. In the worst case scenario, if no tourists were visiting the affected areas, GDP was projected to decline by 1.3%. The first quarter growth rate of 2005 turned out to be a robust 3.3%, but the annual growth rate fell to 4.5%, lower, significantly lower compared to the 6.2% growth achieved in 2004 and much lower than what was predicted by analysts. The current account recorded a deficit of 6.4 billion US dollars in the first seven months of 2005 compared with a surplus of 3.4 billion US dollars a year earlier. Inflation rose from 2.7% in 2004 to 4.5% in 2005 and the trade deficit widened to 8.5% of the GDP. The current account surplus of 1.7% of GDP in 2004 turned into a 4.4% deficit in 2005, says Bhanu Puong Nidip Prabha in the ADBI sponsored study. Along Thailand's 960 kilometers of Andaman coast, wave heights were highest in three provinces, Phang Na, Phuket and Krabi, which also accounted for 8,146 of the 8,327 lives lost due to the tsunami. In Phang Na province, the highest waves occurred in Khao Lak district, where tsunami waves reached more than 10 meters high and killed more people than in any other district. In the Khao Lak area, the tsunami killed about 3,000 out of the 15,000 people there. In resorts and other buildings near the Khao Lak shore, the tsunami waves blew out walls on the first and second floors. In Phuket province, the highest wavelengths of 5 to 6 meters occurred along Patong Beach, the province's most popular beach. In Krabi province, the tsunami most acutely impacted the PP Don Island, where one area was hit by the tsunami from two directions. The island is shaped like the letter H, and when the tsunami arrived, it completely inundated the center of the island from both the north and the south, with waves of 5.8 and 4.6 meters in height. Thus says the WHO report called the Asian Tsunami 2004, a comprehensive analysis, the link of which has been put up in the description box below the video. Several natural warnings preceded the tsunami in Thailand. Because Thailand is east of the tsunami generating earthquake fault and was relatively close at around 500 kilometers to the earthquake epicenter, the first tsunami wave to arrive in Thailand was preceded by both the earth shaking and a large sea withdrawal. The tsunami reached most of the impacted coastlines in Thailand about two hours following the earthquake rupture. Within this two hour period, tsunami witnesses observed shaking, sea withdrawal and loud explosion like sounds before the first destructive tsunami wave arrived. In a survey of 663 witnesses who were in the area at the time of the tsunami, 24% said they felt ground shaking, 21% observed strange animal behavior, 69% saw the sea behave unusually and 55% heard something unusual. Witnesses observed unusual behavior of the sea, estimated 3.5 minutes before the tsunami arrived. Witnesses who heard something unusual just moments before the tsunami compared it with the sound of thunder, a jet or a train. Of the 663 respondents, 81% said they had to evacuate to safety and of them, 54% said they ran as fast as possible. Along the Andaman coast, the tsunami couldn't have occurred at a worse time. In December and January of each year, tourist season peaks at the coast and tourists and locals fill the beaches. With waves reaching as high as 10 meters, the tsunami killed 2,392 foreigners from 37 countries and approximately 6,000 6, Thai nationals. 
In addition, an estimated 91,638 Thai nationals lost a family member or home to the tsunami. In some cases, local infrastructure exacerbated the impact of the waves. For example, many of the 160 people the tsunami killed in Patong City died when they could not escape from the basement floor of a shopping complex and garage. In the fishing village of Ban Nam Khem, where the tsunami killed 3,000 people out of a population of 4,800 people, buildings did not have sufficiently strong columns to keep them from collapsing and its main roads ran parallel to the coast, making it difficult to escape inland. Additionally, mining ponds located near shore in Ban Nam Khem may have prevented some people from escaping when the tsunami waves washed them into the ponds. Among the coastlines that would be hardest hit by the tsunami, Thailand's resort areas confronted the tsunami with the strongest building infrastructure. Along tourism saturated areas of the Andaman coast, such as Phuket, tourist building infrastructure was modern and built to high standards compared to the coastal building infrastructure found along the coast of other countries hit by the tsunami. For the most part, locals living along the Andaman coast lived in non-engineered, one-story, reinforced concrete houses that were weak in the face of the tsunami, says the WHO report. Sea gypsies and other fishing communities living on the coast of Thailand's Andaman Sea coast were some of the most vulnerable communities additionally because they were bereft of land titles to their holdings. In addition to the weak structures, Many Thai communities also had a weak hold over possession of their land. In many sea gypsy and fishing communities, families living along coasts had lived on coastal lands for years or even centuries, but had never acquired mm. land titles. While Thai law allows villagers to apply for title deeds after inhabiting public land for 10 years, the application process was slow. Additionally, many of the sea gypsies and fishermen living in small communities along the coast could not read. Consequently, it was difficult for many of these families to acquire titles for the land that they inhabited, even if they had inhabited, inhabited the land for many generations. In some cases, land disputes arose due to conflicting claims of various groups. In the tourism sector in Thailand, 315 hotels and 234 restaurants were totally or partially destroyed. In addition, some 4,306 shops, many of them largely dependent on tourism, have been lost. The tsunami disaster heavily affected the infrastructure of the main economic sectors of the Andaman coast, in particular the tourism and the fishing industries. It also impacted the agriculture sector. The losses in these three sectors are estimated at 321 million US dollars, 43 million US dollars and 0.65 million respectively, says the UNEP study. Joseph Knauer, the Austrian filmmaker who, along with his family, survived the Asian tsunami in Kaolanta in Thailand, shares his first-hand experience again in an exclusive email interview given to me. Quote, two days after the tsunami, we went back to the beach resort and helped the owners clean up and restore normalcy. After that, we all gathered into the pickup truck. We drove to a hilltop. A lot of locals and tourists had already come there. Not all were as lucky as we were, as we had already had packed for leaving, we had all our belongings with us. We spent two nights on the hilltop. In the first evening, we realized the enormity of the disaster, as some people had called home and were informed by their relatives that about what had happened and it being a tsunami, and it had reached all the coasts of the Indian Ocean Rim countries and had even touched Africa. We heard that about 3,000 Swedish people had were killed. We heard that... Oh, of all the damage and that the tsunami had killed people in India, Thailand, Bali, and Indonesia. So we borrowed a phone and told our relatives home that we were safe. In the evening, Sid, who showed up with his broken nose, called home and his mother told him about the death of his eight best friends who were traveling on India's east coast for another friend's wedding. The moor on the hill was very happy on the one hand that we had all survived, but we also knew that we were lucky, we were more lucky than many others. The number of dead people rose every hour and it didn't seem to stop. Far below us, we saw wave after wave coming towards the island. A long wooden pyre was destroyed. The planks were drifting in the water. We had to line up for water and food. The local people did what they could to improve the situation. We were several, we were several hundred people at this spot. After two nights, Anne and me drove down to see the damage. Almost all the bungalows were broken, the kitchen destroyed by the bar, 
we went to an internet cafe and watched news pictures from the surrounding islands and other countries we watched big waves crashing and destroying buildings and people on tv and only at that moment we realized the full picture and disaster almost all the bungalows were broken the kitchen destroyed by the bar we went to an internet cafe and watched news pictures from the surrounding islands and other countries we watched the big waves crashing and destroying all buildings and people on tv and only at that moment we realized the full picture and the disaster after two days i bought my family brought back to the beach together with ann kauru and a german couple we settled into the last remaining bungalows and started clearing the area at that moment all of the people connected to bb's bungalows were safe only zabina was missing she had gone for a day trip day trip to see kopi p on the day of the tsunami we had all had it clear sabina might not come back we tried to connect with her relatives but there was this thick cloud hanging above us we all tried not to think about the worst case together we were working all day to clear the area we found a passport here there some money here some belongings we tried to separate useful and broken materials we set up a basic kitchen the mood was very somber believe me after 5 days a car entered the area zabina jumped out of it so we many of us felt a rush of emotion Tears held back, broke free at that moment. At 31 on at 31st of December, he means on 31st of December. On the 31st of December, we celebrated a very calm, peaceful, and touchy and poignant Sylvester or the New Year Eve. It's the German word for New Year Eve. We had all survived, but we also knew many families would never see their relatives again. That was the tragic part. in the maldives in the maldives the tsunami had severe effects on the tourism sector 87 resorts sustained damage totaling more than 100 million us dollars in the maldives the tsunami had disastrous effects on the tourism sector three foreign tourists died and 19 of the country's 87 resorts sustained damages and are closed rebuilding the resorts will cost an estimated 100 million us dollars Business losses are estimated at 250 US dollars. Tourist arrivals have declined markedly. Typically in January and February, which is high season in the Maldives, bed occupancy is at 90%. The bed occupancy rate, however, had declined by between 20 to 30% after the tsunami. And approximately 5000 of the country's 17000 hotel beds are not in use. of that number 1200 hotel beds have sustained serious damage and will remain closed for the year 2005 scheduled and charter flights have been reduced and many resorts have reduced their staff sizes in the interest of regaining previous tourist arrival rates and restoring damaged resort capacities the ministry of tourism has been providing situation updates to travel and trade partners and diplomatic missions the ministry had also formulated a post tsunami marketing campaign relaxed resort lease rents for a 3 month period and provided technical assistance to the tourism industry regarding insurance claims says the UNEP study the ministry of tourism in in the maldives has identified short and long term needs Short term requirements include reconstruction of damaged tourist facilities, implementation of a marketing campaign, training for new recruits required by the industry and retraining of unemployed staff. Long term plans and requirements include strengthening disaster crisis management planning, training protocols and procedures, developing post tsunami destination marketing, an assessment of the tourism sector economic losses, an assessment of long term impacts on marine life and training and advice for hotel owners on insurance matters. Technical and financial assistance is required to undertake these actions. During the reconstruction process, the tourism industry should be encouraged to consider environmental protection and conservation needs and to adopt these best environmental practices management practices economic losses something hanging on my computer economic losses were particularly evident in the tourism and fishing sectors of the country's 87 resorts 21 closed due to tsunami damage and of these five were badly damaged the hotel sustained damage as well a 2005 damage assessment indicated that of the 5042 beds out of operation after the tsunami 
1,200 had been badly damaged and would not become operational before the end of 2005. Additionally, the assessment estimated that it would cost approximately 100 million US dollars to rebuild damaged resorts. 74 relatively few boats and little fishing gear was lost due to the tsunami. The agricultural sector in the Maldives was one of the worst hit. Seawater damaged an estimated 1,200 farms and smallholder plots. The country's environmental protection capacities need to be expanded and strengthened on an urgent basis. With the national economy based principally on nature tourism, the risks of differing action to prevent and mitigate pollution and resource depletion are too great for the country to assume. The MEC needs additional technical and administrative staff as well as training and other assistance aimed at strengthening management and technical skills. Consideration should be given to separating the environment and construction functions of the ABC to create a separate environment ministry as should development of a tall level environment capacity. Following the tsunami and sharp decline in tourism arrivals, the Tourism Promotion Board and the private sector ramped up tourism marketing efforts in order to restore tourist arrivals to pre-tsunami levels. Additionally, the government undertook a te tourism sector expansion program which included the leasing of 35 additional islands for resort development. Consequently, tourist arrivals had largely returned to pre-tsunami levels by the end of 2006. Livelihood assistance in the fishery sector in two sectors, Lambada and Lamga, was found to have had a positive impact on the fishery community. But some of the assistance did not suit local needs and standards, including the design and materials used for constructing fishing boats. Furthermore, the quality of the wood used for the construction of boats was so low that they easily deteriorated or began to leak. In some cases, assistance was not delivered in a complete package to the beneficiaries, which resulted in the lack of efficacy for productive business. In other cases, the assistance was not used for productive purposes, but rather was misused by the recipients for their daily household needs, says the IRP report. During 2004, tourism represented the largest industry, accounting for 32% of its gross domestic product and more than 60% of its foreign exchange receipts. Additionally, the government received more than 90% of its tax revenue from import duties and tourism-related taxes. 170,171 during the 2000 period 2000 to 2004. The fishing sector's share of the GDP paled in comparison to the tourism sector, accounting for an average of only 6.4% of the GDP. However, the fishing sector played an important role in the economy in terms of employment, livelihoods and exports, 15,91 and accounted for about 60% of the Maldivian exports and employed approximately 11% of the population, says the WHO report, the Asian Tsunami 2004, a comprehensive analysis, the link of which is put up in the description box below. The percentage of women employed in the tourism sector was a minor in comparison to males in the Maldives, especially in rural areas. Hence, women were worse off in the tourist sector in rural Maldives in the aftermath of the tsunami. The need for livelihood options and monetary support to more vulnerable communities was felt, especially in the Maldives, because women employed in the tourism sector were working in the capacity of cooks, sweepers and cleaners, not in the high income bracket even in peacetime. In the aftermath of the Asian tsunami, when tourist resorts were devastated in the Maldives and tourism revenue dropped, the women emerged as the most vulnerable communities with the least resilience. Economic losses were particularly evident in the tourism and fishing sectors. Of the country's 87 resorts, 21 closed due to tsunami damage and of these, 5 were badly damaged. The hotel sustained damage as well. A 2005 damage assessment indicated that of the 5,042 beds out of operation after the tsunami, 1,200 had been badly damaged and would not become operational before the end of 2005. Additionally, the assessment estimated that it would cost approximately 100 million US dollars to rebuild damaged resorts. 74 relatively few boats and little fishing gear were lost due to the tsunami. In proportion to the size of its economy, the Maldives suffered the greatest economic losses due to the tsunami. The tsunami caused $298 million in direct losses. Total losses, however, including indirect losses such as wages, were an estimated $470 million US dollars or 62% of the GDP. In the immediate aftermath of the tsunami, about one-third of the Maldives' hotel, safari and guest house beds were out of operation. During what would usually be the peak tourism season, arrivals dropped in the weeks following the tsunami. 
In the first 11 days of January 2005, there were 20,308 airport arrivals compared to the first 11 days of January 2004. 74 many, many resorts reduced staff due to lower occupancy rates after the tsunami. Resort staff who retained jo their jobs also felt the impact of lower occupancy rates uh, since a 10% service charge typically provided 50% of their income. Fishing, hotels and tourism together contributed 3% of the GNP including 100,000 jobs in the fishing industry and 27,000 jobs in tourism. Employment numbers in the industrial sector grew more than 600,000 to 1.7 million while employment numbers in the services sector nearly doubled from 1.7 million in 1990 to 3.2 million in 2004. The total number of people employed in all sectors was 7.4 million. Many people in the Maldives rely on community or individual rainwater storage tanks for their drinking water supplies. According to the Maldives Water and Sanitation Authority, more than 90% have been damaged. In 2005, economy contracted for the first time in recent history after several years of strong growth. The Maldives posted a negative growth rate of 4.5%, says the WHO report. In the, all the tsunami affected countries that suffered damage, the most important lesson learned was not to put all the eggs in one basket. Alternate livelihood options were the key to economic resilience. To recap, calamities recur. In essence, it is wise not to store all the apples in one cart. Alternate livelihood options are the only paths to resilience against livelihood destruction. One has to reckon with the destructive forces of nature and build back better sustainably. There is wisdom in the ancient proverb, save for a rainy day. It is up to us to be prepared with the resilience for the next calamity. Livelihoods dependent on fair weather conditions are at best fragile. To wean people away from dependence on Mother Nature's bounty, it is essential to give them long-term training for new vocations just so that they can overcome trauma of the previous calamity and sustain themselves in the next round. New vocations have to defer to the power of Mother Nature and should include sustainable development practices. Sustainable development does not mean sustaining poverty. Resourceful, creative, dynamic application for renew, rep, replicable, aspirational growth is the key to sustainable development. Training in new vocations have to be sustainable and beneficiaries must be given infrastructure support for new vocations, be it aquaculture or information technology. Infrastructure development must defer to and include ecological sustainability. Significance of agrometeorological deference to traditional livelihoods is central to sustainable livelihood security. And that is all for tonight. We have finished chapter 17. The impact of the Asian tsunami on tourism in the near term and long term economy and infrastructure. In next week's book reading, we will be dealing with chapter 18, which is about media guidelines for disaster preparedness and reporting. I hope to catch you all during the live interaction on 22nd January at 7.30 p.m. Indian time. Until then, until next week's video, take care, keep smiling, stay home, stay safe. Ciao.